graduate of Westmont. He led his team his senior year to the national tournament, and he's gone on to become a quite successful basketball coach, most recently uh, taking his Azusa Pacific women's team to the national championship title game last year. And uh, I'm guessing he's thinking he might do a little bit better this year. <laughs> TJ, thanks for being here. It is truly uh, a great honor and privilege to be able to be here tonight at Westmont College. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about uh, Tyne Hardiman. Uh, TJ is Tyne Jr., so I know him fairly well. Uh, the idea of, of an introduction, when you introduce someone, I'm thinking, well, how do you introduce uh, Tyne Hardiman? And, uh, you know, he's, his life has been something that he has lived to the fullest. His, his life verse that I have heard every time he's preached, every time he gives his testimony, every time he talks to anybody in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And he always puts his own name in that. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, Tyne Hardiman, uh, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. I grew up hearing that, but watching it. Uh, watching it modeled out. And uh, Tyne Hardiman comes to you tonight as someone who, as a young boy, knew, I want an education. I want an education. And he, he was someone that came to Westmont College not to play basketball, but came to Westmont College to get an education and to learn about God and to get closer to him. Now, while he was here, uh, I know there's probably a number of gentlemen in this room who saw a 6'4", probably weighed about 170 pounds at the time, uh, man walking around and said, uh, Tyne, do you play basketball at all? Well, he had played a lot of basketball and was really at Westmont thinking, it's time to do something else in your life. And, uh, but while he was here, he decided, I think with some encouragement, probably from some of you, again, I'll pick up that ball and play. And uh, he played a couple years and did well. But after, uh, was it after your second or third year here that you decided to go logging? After his second year, uh, in, between West, uh, in between years, Westmont obviously cost a, a few dollars. A lot fewer than today, I'm sure, but <laughs> you know, uh, he, he had an offer from a friend to go up to Oregon and work in, uh, as, a, as a logger. And while he was up there, I'm sure many of you have heard his testimony, he, had a, he wrestled with a five-foot thick, 40-foot long log that rolled over him, knocked him down a ravine, uh, broke his back in a number of places, broke his right leg in a number of places. And uh, the doctors proceeded to tell him it was a huge miracle that he was still alive. But it would be a bigger miracle if he ever walked again. And uh, two years later, he was the 10th leading scorer in the nation here at Westmont College. And you know, it was in one of those games where he set the record uh, scoring 46 points against Chapman. Uh, but it's funny, when, when I talked with John about the Hall of Fame, he never talks about any of his records at all. I had to look in books to see him because he's always talking about what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next? Where's God going to lead? What's God going to do? And uh, it's, it's funny in a world today when you talk Hall of Fame, how many people you think, okay, Hall of Fame. Well, mostly they're talking about why people are being excluded. You know, you can hit more home runs than anybody, but if you're doing it with, you know, if you're doing it with steroids, you're not going to get in the Hall of Fame. Or if you're gambling and you've got more hits than anybody, but you're gambling along, you're not going to make the Hall of Fame. Uh, if you play for the Celtics, I don't know how soon you're going to get in the Laker Hall of Fame. You know, there's, there's just, we wonder about different allegiances. Well, Dad, what he has done after he left Westmont College has just dwarfed everything that he did here. Um, we were figuring with, uh, with Robin Cook the other day, who was a, in Sports Ambassadors, where he spent his life. Um, that he's probably played over 4,000 basketball games. And in each one of those games, he's sharing Christ's love. 
He's talking about why he's here, what he's doing, and challenging people to know where they're going in life and saying, Jesus Christ has a plan for your life. And I'd heard that number a little bit, and it wasn't until today that I kind of figured, let's see, 365 days in a year. I go, that's 11 years of a game a day. That's a lot of games um, that he has played, and with the sole purpose to say, I'm going to use this as a tool to witness. And as I was here tonight, I've seen, I've been in so many of your houses because you've supported Tyne and Jan Hardiman and their family. You've supported them by prayer, by just being, being there as friends and encouragement. And uh, he spent his life in 1958, uh, he went to the Philippines, and they're still there. They're still there witnessing. And, and yet, Westmont College and all of that, uh, I'm one of four children, all of us attended Westmont. And it, it was just funny tonight to hear just different people that have had contact with Dad that have ended up at Westmont. Because he's talking about the Lord first and foremost. Westmont's not far behind. You know? I mean, he is always sharing. You know, if you want a good Christian school, if you want to go to a place where you can have, make friendships that are going to last a lifetime, you should think about Westmont. And uh, there's just those lifetime friends. Many of you are here tonight. And it just really is a testament to God's love, God's provision, and uh, just the way that he has guided uh, in my dad's life. And uh, it's, just, it's just a privilege for me tonight to be able to uh, congratulate, uh, thank, and uh, just, just uh, I'm kind of speechless just thinking uh, with this award, and, but also knowing that to dad, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's not a big deal because he loves Westmont and he's very excited, but he's saying, you know what, I want God to be glorified in everything I do. And, uh, and I'm sure that, that those of you that know him know that's how he lives his life. And so it's been an encouragement to me, to my family, and we just thank, uh, you know, his, he's got brothers and sisters. I've got uh, two daughters that are here and a son-in-law. He's got a great grandson that is uh, about 15 days old that's here, you know, so um, he inspires that. He just inspires that in people to say, I want to be part of that and be around that. So uh, congratulations, Dad, and well, well won. That doesn't mean I don't have much to say. Three things guide our lives. Our families, our education, and the service we become involved in. And I stand, I'm sure I'm the oldest inductee to the Hall of Fame <laughs> that Westmont's ever had. And I'm standing up here with two artificial knees worn out from all those basketball games. But what I want to share with you this evening are these three things and how they played in my life, and I think they play in yours to some degree. My family with four children, 13 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, are a tremendous blessing to me. They're a sign of God's blessing upon what I've been doing for the past 50 years. And we just finished our 53rd year in the Philippines, and we don't have a goal of coming back. Yes, we love America. We're Americans. We love America. It's fun to be here. And you know, I've got more friends in this room tonight 
it is hard to just realize that I'm here with you and can enjoy you for a weekend. And I want to say thanks. Thanks for coming. And uh, it's so wonderful to see you again. But I came from a very disjointed family. I have uh, five brothers and four sisters. The brother right underneath me is sitting over here, and my sister is here. And it's a privilege to have them here. I was shocked that they are coming. It's really neat. Thanks a lot, Linda and Harvey. But family is what gives us a foundation for life. And uh, my mom loved the Lord and uh, made sure that we went to church and Sunday school and every time the door was open. But I didn't become a child of God until I was a freshman in college, being thwarted to go to UCLA because I wasn't my grades weren't good enough. And I wanted to go play for Johnny Wooden, but it didn't work out. And, uh, but I found the Lord during that year. It was God's direction in my life. I have a family now that's enlarged. You. When I had my accident up in Oregon, with my body all broken and I was paralyzed from my armpits down and they said, you'll never walk again. I thought, I'll never play basketball. That's how much basketball meant to me. I thought, what am I gonna do with my life if I can't play basketball? But see, God knows tomorrow. And sometimes he has to treat us a little rough to get us to slow down and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me play tennis or run the race or play basketball or whatever. He gives us bodies that can move and uh, accomplish what needs to be done on, in that sport. So my family increased. I remember when I got out of the hospital, I was a month and a half late getting back to Westmont. But I came back to Westmont because this was my home. This was my family. <clears throat> and you showed great love and acceptance. And I felt tremendously blessed to be a part of the Westmont family. Education, as TJ said, I came to Westmont not to play basketball. I remember walking down the hallway up here one day early in the year and this young guy was next to me and he looked up at me and he said, Tyne, do you play basketball? But I wasn't thinking about basketball and I said yes. And that led me into a basketball career here at Westmont. But Westmont gave me a foundation in faith, a belief and a trust in God. Dr. Ryrie, one of my favorite Bible teachers, meant so much to me. He came up to Oregon and he saw me in the hospital when I was injured. Faculty here at, at Westmont care for you. And you're like family to them. And I really, really appreciated it. And I grew tremendously. Something that a lot of you don't know is that I didn't walk down the aisle and graduate here from, from Westmont. While students were graduating, I was in 
Hawaii on my way to Asia for my first sports ambassador trip. And uh, so I didn't get to walk down the graduation aisle and receive my diploma. They gave it to me later on, but <laughs> I go from education into service. My goal was to play basketball for the Lakers. I loved what the uh, chapel speaker had to say this morning in chapel. Boy, he sounded just like me in other words. I mean, he said so many things that I've been saying all my life. Choose what you like to do and find a place that needs that and do it. And stay. You can see I'm a stayer. 53 years. Sometimes it changes. And in 2000, I stopped teaching and stopped coaching and became the sports chaplain at our small Faith Academy High School. It's small, but it's the largest MK school in the world with about 600. And I thought, what am I going to do? I go from teaching six, seven classes a day, coaching volleyball, coaching basketball, athletic director, voila, nothing. I'm sitting in my office waiting for students to come and talk to me, or I walk out during lunchtime and in between classes and different times to meet with students and things. But I'm doing nothing. And I'm saying, God, what are you doing? What do you want me to do? You go from a highly active life to sitting. I, you know, many times they would say, during my earlier years at Faith Academy, they'd say, well, Tiny Hot, we need a, a principal, or we need a superintendent. Or, not for, I don't want to go sit. I'm, not, I'm an outside guy. I don't want go in there and sit down, and I refuse, but here I am, I'm sitting. What's God going to do? Well, it took me a little while of thinking and thinking, and I came up with a plan of how to reach Filipinos. Listen, let me tell you this. I'm going to interject something here. I hope I can remember where I am. People many times are afraid to go overseas in missionary work. But I want to assure you that it's the most fun, most unbelievable experience you can have. And I think it's because when you give your life into God's hand and he can take all that he's made you and use it to bring people to know him, it's the most exciting experience a human being can have. And I've been doing this for 50 some years. So as I sat there in my office wondering, well now what am I gonna do? I'm not teaching, I'm not coaching. You know, I just finished coaching a young man that played on, went to UCLA, made All-American two years in a row then went to two Olympics on the U.S. volleyball team. But now I'm doing nothing, just sitting. But this thought came, and I think the Holy Spirit kind of gave it to me. See, because in uh, about 1990, the uh, Pinatubo, a big volcano, exploded and drove out all the American bases. And it disrupted our league. Well, I mean, it just well, it fell apart because those two schools and a couple of American schools there in, in Manila and Faith made up our league. And here those two big ones were gone. And uh, it changed our whole outlook on who we're going to play. And so today 
we play all Filipino teams mostly. Now, don't feel sorry. There are Filipinos taller than me, a lot of them. And my boys, because they're American boys, doesn't mean they get to lord it over everybody. There are a lot of good, tall Filipino players. And uh, so it was a challenge. But in this new era, without Clark and Subic and those bases, we're playing all Filipino teams. And many times, the Filipino schools had no transportation. And we're out about 10 miles in the country up on the foothills, our school is. And they couldn't get there. And so we said, OK, we'll come pick you up. We'll send a van and pick you up and bring you up and play and then take you home. And that's what we did. So what I thought one day was, oh, we'll just bring them 30 minutes early, and I can talk with them. <laughs> First year, I was able to share and lead over 180 of the best Filipino athletes to know Jesus. There's no greater joy in life than sitting down with someone and sharing with them the real purpose of life. And having them listen so intently, you know, I've been doing this now for about five or six years. And I do it with 10 or 12 teams a year and every time as I share this and help, uh, help them to see what it really means to be a Christian and then ask them, what about you? Have you made this choice in your life? Would you like to do that today? Every one of them raises their hand. I've discovered that my Catholic friends are about this close to salvation. They've never been told that Jesus is the only way, the only door into heaven. And as I take, because, you know, I feel, I really feel undressed tonight because I don't have my Bible in my back pocket. Because I always carry that Bible in my back pocket. I want to be ready when the opportunity comes to share with people. And you never know where it is. I've had people come up to me on a boat, in a Jeep, on a plane, on a bike while I'm out exercising, while I'm running, while I'm sitting down to have a Pepsi, whatever. <coughs> and the door opens for me to lead them to Jesus. And so as I share with these people from their scriptures, the Catholic Bible, I see them. Oh, I didn't know that. I, really? God wants us to know that we're part of his family? Because, you know, I like to ask my Catholic friends, how did you become a Christian? Mm, you get a lot of answers. I've been baptized. I was born in a Christian family. I, I go to church all the time. I, whatever, whatever. And I said, those are good things. But according to your word, that's not what gets you into heaven. There's only one way. Let me read it to you. And I turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, 12, and 13. And it says, and this is the testimony of this book and God that he has given to us eternal life. God has given all of us eternal life. And it's like Christmas time. Somebody gives you a gift, you just receive it and put your faith that it's yours. And then I go and I, after I get them to where they know that, I say, and then it says, and this life is in his son. It's the Catholic Bible now. It's the same as, as our Bible. And it says, and this life is in his son. And so I have somebody there 
read it so that they know I'm not putting into there something that's not there. And they read it. And I said, notice it doesn't say it's in the Protestant church or evangelical church or the Catholic church or any church, as good as they might be. But eternal life is in his son. And once they grasp that, which I'm sure all of you do, I say, let's look at that next verse. It says, and he who has the son has eternal life. Not he that knows about it. They all know it. I said, who's the son? They say, Jesus. They know. But they've never, ever been told that they've got to have him in their heart. They've got to receive him. And so I said, how do you get the son? Nobody ever knows. I love to work with Filipino people. Oh, they're so gracious and so interested in spiritual things. I said, I want to give you two illustrations. One's about a garden and a big mural in England. Beautiful garden with bougainvillea growing over the wall and the flowers and everything inside. Along one side of that garden is a gate. I said, if you ever see that mural, notice closely. There's a man standing at the gate knocking. I said, if you look real close, you'll notice there's no knob, no door handle, nothing. It's just smooth. The only way that man can get in that, gate, that garden is for someone to hear him knocking and come and open the gate and let him in. I said, Jesus comes knocking on your heart's door. He is the creator of everything. But he doesn't force himself into your life. You have to hear him and open that door. Then I said the other illustration is found. Now listen closely. I'm, now I'm going to trick you. It's found in the last book of the Bible, which is, what's the last book of the Bible? Pardon? Revelation. No, it's not Revelation. And I said, look. And I gave him the Catholic Bible. It's Apocalypse. <laughs> I said, this is a Catholic Bible. See, I'm building rapport. I want them to know I'm not pulling the wool over their eyes. This is their Bible. This is what it says. That Jesus is the only way to get to God. Not a specific church or religion, but it's Jesus. And so I said, let's turn to Apocalypse 3, 20. How many of you know that verse? <laughs> I think most of you do. It's Jesus, and he's speaking, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and hear me knocking and open that door, I will come into him and live in him, sup with him, and he with me. And when Jesus comes into our heart, that's final. That makes us a part of God's family. I said, okay, let's go back to 1 John 5, 11, 12, verse 13. John says, these things I'm writing to you who are trusting in Jesus so that you may know you have eternal life. So if anybody's here this evening, I feel like I'm, the pastor should be up here. <laughs> if you've never opened your heart to Jesus, you're not part of God's family. Because the only way to have eternal life, according to the scriptures, is opening your heart to Jesus Christ. And so it's my joy. I mean, and another thing, being in the Philippines, the grayer your hair gets, the more they listen to you. <laughs> when I was young and I could outrun, outjump, outshoot, block everybody, you know, that was okay. But now it's been listening intently. And it's thrilling for me. I'm never going to quit. 
God's going to have to hit me over the head with another log to move me along. I am hard-headed, but I enjoy so much serving him. Family, education, service. Westmont played a super, super part in preparing me to go. And I, with joy, tell people, I had a little lady this morning in chapel come up to me. She said, Mr. Hardiman, do you remember me? No, I don't remember her. She was a little Asian girl. And she just graduated last year, but she's going to, to Westmont this year. She said, I'm here because you. And uh, Ron Mulder was just sharing with me uh, before the meeting tonight that I'm the reason he's here. And I could point back to Dwight Anderson and say he's one of the reasons I'm here because his testimony touched my heart and life. We're family. We work together. We serve the King of Kings. And I just praise the Lord to be a part. I, I feel thrilled to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but I tell you, I wouldn't trade my experiences. Well, let me tell you another story. I got lots of stories. <laughs> Not too many of you are asleep. But I know when I was here at Westmont, the coach said, Time, when you finish over there, come back here and I'll give you my job coaching at uh, the varsity basketball team. And um, well, the time came and I was asked to come back and coach uh, here. And uh, it was TJ's first year. And we were going to be in Santa Barbara anyway. So they needed a coach at that time. And I said, sure. I'll do it. I'll be gone. I can't teach, but I'll be gone a lot doing my deputation. But I came back. And um, during that year, I discovered what a fantastic place I'm working in out in the Philippines. You don't have to go out and recruit. You just get the missionary kids. And uh, you make the most of what you got. And uh, when it came to the end of the year, I remember going in and talking to the president and saying, I'm going to go back to the Philippines. He said, but time, we want you to stay. And I said, you can get lots of people to take this job. But during that whole year, I'd been asking and telling people there was an opportunity in the Philippines to coach in a great high school. Nobody. But I remember after. I talked to uh, the president and told him I wasn't going to be back. And he announced it. In the first week, they had 40-some people apply for the job at Westmont. A lot of times, we go through life, we are doing like the chapel speaker said. We're looking for a job that pays well and uh, makes the name for themselves instead of a place where we can serve and use our talents. And uh, I made the right choice. Uh, Chet Cameron kind did a super job. And uh, people here loved him. And uh, it was great. And I've gone back, and I still enjoy it. I want to take this opportunity as I close to thank all of you who pray for us. Uh, a lot of people won't even come visit us in the Philippines because they're scared to death. But I'll tell you, we're just as safe there as you are here. Maybe more. Because they love Americans in the Philippines. Uh, and so I want to thank you for praying for us and thank you for supporting us over the years. God bless you. Thank you for the honor of being in the Hall of Fame. I don't know if you're like me, but I sat there for the last few minutes thinking, why did we wait 55 years to hear this? <laughs> Thank you, Time.
Tyne's, uh, one of Tyne's son, Todd, was a senior when I was a freshman here at Westmont, and, uh, and we were on, I was on the basketball team, and uh, Todd and, and Jeff Azen uh, took me under their wing and taught me how, how it was to be a Westmont basketball player as a freshman, and so it's, it's neat how the legacy continues. Uh, thank you, Tyne. Um, you know, there's a lot of demands on a college president on homecoming weekend, and um, I am so uh, thankful that Gail and Pam have chosen to spend the night with us, and uh, I've asked Gail to close us uh, with a few words, and uh, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the Department of Athletics for being here, and Gail, thanks for being here. Well, what a wonderful evening, and it's not hard for Pam and I to come. We love hearing the stories of the athletes and celebrating your success. The last time we were together in this venue was 2007 when we were inducting Mark and Casey into the Hall of Fame, and that was just an incredible night as well, and uh, that the memory of that evening still lingers in our minds as this one will. David, thank you for all you've done for our athletic department, for your leadership. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I enjoyed athletics growing up and played uh, athletics, competed in athletics through college, and there are so many life lessons that you learn uh, that really do serve you well long after you're done competing. And I think that they are uh, lessons that really can be channeled to great purposes. Uh, tonight we've heard about Tyne, Reva, and Miriam, and these are incredible stories, and I have loved hearing them. You should have just finished with the altar call. You're right there on the cusp. <laughs> and, and, and you're, you're ready to bring it home. So we could have taken the offering and it would have all been good. But the growing up in a university town, athletics was very much a part of our life. And my father uh, would often, when the uh, local university played, Athletes in Action would make us go to the game, and we always had to stay after the game finished to hear the testimony of the players. And it was always interesting to me in one year, uh, and I've told this story before, but one year Athletes in Action beat uh, the University of Oregon. I grew up in Eugene. And uh, it was so interesting because every year that the U of O won, uh, maybe 500 people would stay. But the year that Athletes in Action won, uh, probably 5,000 people stayed. It was a 12,000 seat stadium at that time. And as we drove home that night, my father said, you have to learn to win in the way the world respects to, to earn the right to be heard. And I've so often thought that in athletics, uh, what we learn is how to win in a way that the world will respect so that we can win the right to be heard. The other thing that I think is so important to learn through athletics is that the two most important things that you have to learn in life, or I believe you have to learn in life, is that the only things in life you control are your attitude and your effort. And there are so many things that you discover through athletics where you can't control them. You can't control what kind of ref you get, but you can control the kind of response you make to a ref. You can't always control what kind of conditions you play under, and my goodness, I would hate to have played under the conditions which were described. Uh, and tennis was never a sport, so that would have been a challenge to begin with. <laughs> but you can control the attitude and the effort that you put forth. And those are lessons that I, I think the best place you learn them are through athletic competition. And long after you've uh, had to give up athletic competition, those are really spiritual disciplines that serve you well. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful celebration. And thank you for your love and dedication to Westmont. We're grateful. <laughs>